Ron, especially for coming and talking to us about this. A lot of interest. I've, I've gotten several emails about this. Um, a little bit about him and his background before I turn the time over to him and get him started. So Ron Harris is a professor in geological sciences at Brigham Young University who specializes in mountain building processes and associated geological hazards. He was born and raised in Oregon and received his bachelor's in geological sciences from the University of Oregon. He obtained his master's in geophysics from the Geophysical Institute of Alaska and a PhD in geodynamics from the University College London in the UK. He has published 75 papers, a book on geology of Little Cottonwood Canyon, which is phenomenal, and been invited to give 90 talks throughout the world. Ron has worked for oil, mining, and environmental companies for the US Geological Survey and with governments of several developing countries. His pioneering research involves advances in natural disaster mitigation. Ron is the founder of the nonprofit organization In Harm's Way that identifies areas of the world most vulnerable to natural disasters and works with community-based organizations in these areas to assess and communicate risk and Im implement effective disaster risk reduction strategies that have saved thousands of lives. Uh, when I was a student at BYU, I got to see and hear about a lot of this good that he's done taking his degree and making a real difference to the lives of people. So such a pleasure to hear some of his local work here and also just his expertise. So Ron, without further ado, we're super excited to hear from you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I love the work that is being done by the Geological Association. And it's wonderful to see Maria um, so active. Uh, definitely one of my favorite students. I know you're not supposed to have favorite students, but it always happens. Um, uh, when I first went to the Beaver Dam Mountains, um, I had already been working in the Himalaya for some, some time, and I immediately felt at home. And the good thing about it is it wasn't up, you know, at 6,000, 7,000 meters where it's really hard to, to, to breathe, and it would take you almost, you know, four hours to walk up to that mountain there. Um, and here was a place that was warm, accessible, but had the same, essentially the same geological relationships and, and provided a lot of these really interesting um, uh, questions about uh, the overprinting of deformation during a mountain building process. Because a mountain building pr process, you know, is, is made up of three phases. The accumulation phase, which is essentially where you have a passive margin that accumulates sediment for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And then that passive margin eventually is pulled into a subduction zone because it's attached to an oceanic plate. And when it gets to, to the subduction zone, um, it starts to stack up. Most of the passive margin material is too weak to go down very far and so it starts being pushed back up over the craton and then eventually there's um the third the so the first stage is the accumulation phase the second is the convergence phase and the third is the collapse phase where the origin collapses and all three are right 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 here i mean you can see if i show you a cross section of the himalaya this is looking to um to to the east uh, you can see Mount Everest right here, and it has um, at the very top of it uh, two detachment faults, which are bringing much, much younger and um, uh, non-metamorphous rocks in contact with metamorphic ba basement, where a lot of crust has been cut out. And that's, you know, happening as the or origin is growing because um you can only you know gravity will, will limit how how high you can grow a mountain range um and then it starts to collapse on its own weight especially once it gets thermally re, re, re equilibrated so that the crust be, becomes weaker and so then it, it doesn't have as strong as a found foundation and so you can see here these two faults one puts the Mississippi limestone on top of the Bonanza King Cambrian lime, limestone. So you've cut out, you know, all the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian rocks there. 
and um, and then you have the Bonanza King sitting right on top of um, 1.7 billion year old metamorphic rocks with everything between that cut out. And um, you see between those two rocks, a green schist overprint. That was the big discovery that we made in in the beaver dams is that green schist overprint, which is which really clarifies a lot of the processes that are going on. So what is a pallum test? It, it's essentially a, uh, a document where you've where you've you've written over previous writings like this. And that's what's going on in most mountain belts, and especially as a structural geologist, you have to understand the, the, the writing that was there before and the writing that came after and how it influences each other. And that's, that's the, the, the key to understanding the beaver dams is to understand the deformational mechanisms that formed each of the structures. Otherwise, all kinds of wild inter interpretations can result, which is, which is, in in influence the the beaver dams. Okay, so if we go back to Utah's Everest, not in terms of how tall or how high it is, but in terms of its geological makeup, you can see here that Everest consists of um, essentially three things. It consists of this Greater Himalayas sequence, which is which is mig migmatized and very high grade metamorphic rock. Sitting on top of that is this brown green schist facies unit right here, which uh, is in green in, in uh, this um, in interpretation to the right. And then you can also see all these red leucogranite bodies, which formed due to decompression melting as the roof of the world collapsed and decompressed these migmatites. And so you have leucogranites intruding this. And then at the top of that, you have a, a yellow band, which is also green schist facies marble. And above that, you have Ordovician sediments with crinoids and brachiopods and corals. And, I mean, it's just incredible, you know, the, the difference between that. This view is here is looking to the south. This view here is looking to the east. And so essentially the view to the right is we're looking from left to right. You can see the peak right there of Everest, which is made up of uh, the non-metamorphosed lime, limestones, and then it also hits these two peaks here, and so on. Um, so what are the Beaver Dam Mountains? Well, if you go to the very corner, the very southwest corner of Utah, there is a little mountain range here called the Beaver Dam Mountains, and um, uh, it has in the core of it, this large brown blob, okay? Some people have called it a large brown other thing. Um, and you can see that, that it hasn't been mapped. It's just a big brown blob referred to as, you know, Precambrian met metamorphic ba basement. And then on top of it, it has an unconformity, the great unconformity, the best place to see the great un unconformity if you wanna, um, well, if you want it to, if you want to see the same thing as in the Grand Canyon, is here. It's so much more accessible than hiking all the way down to the bottom of the Grand Grand Canyon. You can also see it in Santa Cruz Mountains, um, but uh, you can see it here, and it has you know the classic passive margin sequence on top of it with what they call you know the sort of the tinnic quartzite. Um, uh, it's called the Tapetes quartzite or the Tapetes sandstone, and then the bright angel shale, and then the red wall light limestone, and so on. You can see that that the, met, the metamorphic rocks in the core of the range, you, you can see uh, the Google Earth image here, and then this is the U Utah state geological map here. Um, uh, also has something kind of bizarre. It has this area right here, which are pieces of the Bonanza King um, and also Mississippi and limestone sitting like a detached block. And this has caused lots of controversy as to, as to what the origin of that contact is and 
and what happened to get that block there. And we'll be addressing that. So why is the structural analysis of the Beaver Dam Mountains important? Well, basically it's because when you interpret unresolved and newly discovered structure in a region that has been influenced by a series of deformation events, it requires you to identify carefully um, and analyze the deformational mechanisms through time. So some of the motivating questions that, that we had in this research was, you know, which structures are actually brittle, which are plastic, which are viscous, um, what were the conditions of temperature, pressure, fluids, slope stability associated with these, um, what deformation events are the structures associated with, and can we identify similar structures elsewhere? So first, what has changed on the geologic map? So this is the, this is the, uh, sorry. Did, did you guys hear that coming in the headphones? Oh, no or yes? I didn't hear anything unusual. Okay, good, good, okay. So um, this is the Utah State geological map and here's the big brown blob um, that has you know XU so the, the there's two main things that have changed from this map first we've mapped the interior units of the big brown blob and you can say or you you can see that it consists of um, a large orthognise which is an igneous rock that was metamorphosed the yellow are places where there's amphibolite. Um, next to the orthognise, there's uh, paranise, which was probably a, the protolith was a sedimentary rock, which was metamorphosed. And, and it, it's also migmatized, meaning that there's um, parts of that rock that melted and left behind what we call the restite, which is the stuff that didn't melt. And you can also see melt channels going everywhere through that rock. Some of them are tiny, and others have coalesced into big uh, dikes and sills. And, and then uh, you get into the area where uh, you just have the meta sediment and, and then you get into this green zone right here. This is a green schist facies overprint of the metamorphic rocks. And um, and that's very important because it means that there was a later deformation that, that essentially overprinted the metamorphic rock. It's part of this pallum test. And, um, and then below that, you have a lot of, I mean, right, right above that, you have a lot of crust missing, and then you have these large blocks. Okay. So the other main thing that was that was changed is uh, the interpretation of these blocks out here to the southwest. These were mapped as um, the parts of the tertiary muddy muddy creek formation, and uh, and we looked at them, and they they uh, are actually pieces of this Mississippian. Um, Redwall lime, limestone um, that have been, I think, misinterpreted as Muddy Creek. And um, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so the presentation will talk about the Precambrian deformational conditions and tectonic setting. And then we'll go to the Paleozoic pre lithification deformation that we found. And, and we'll also um, talk about the Cretaceous Cordilleran convergence and the tertiary orogenic collapse. All right, so first the early Proterozoic basement. You notice on this map by Karlstrom and others, uh, you can see that the Beaver Dam um, occupies a place where there's a lot of uncertainty as to, about, uh, as to what the origin of the metamorphic basement is. You can see the Yavapai prop, uh, province here, maybe Mojavia, there's some, there's some questions about whether that even exists and so on. And so there's lots of uncertainty. Here's the outcrops 
of um, early paleos early uh, Proterozoic metamorphic rocks in Utah with Farmington Canyon, Antelope Island, Santa Quin Complex, Mineral Mountain Complex, and Beaver Dams. And the rocks to the north of the Cheyenne Belt are um, Archean in, 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 in age. Uh, so you can see the units here. I already described them briefly for you. And um, we've just put general structural measurements on this map, but we've got, you know, over 150 measurements of the internal structure, which we'll talk about. So just a quick overview. This is the orthonice. Um, in some cases, the orthonice doesn't have very much of a fabric. Uh, in other places, it 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 does, and so uh, it looks like it was maybe syn kinematic. Um, this is the paranice, which obviously looks like it was probably a metasediment, and um, it has a lot more foliation. And uh, the schist, which is a little bit more politic than what we think the paranice might have been like turbidites. And here we have some places within the par the it, it interlayered with the paranice, like right here, where you have uh, what looks like more politic units with beautiful garnets and uh, sylmanite and um, other minerals. This is the amphibolite here, which in many cases looks like it was a restite. Like these right right here are are veins of grano, grano diorite and, leuco, and leuco granite that are cutting through this, probably derived from it. You can see these little pieces here and little um, melt blebs there. And uh, this is what a migmatite looks like with little selvages of, of the amphibolite restite. And you, you can see how the Metamorphic grade was so high that we were partially melting these rocks. Uh, we also have pegmatite veins, and we also have lots of leucogranite bodies, which have garnet in, in them. Um, so what about the internal structure? Well, this is an image from the highest peak in the beaver dams, and you can see the uh, orthonices on this side, the paranice is on this side and a beautiful leuco granite body going right between them. You can also see the steep foliation. Um, and let's see. You can see here that um, there's a garnet here with a little um, stress tail. And you can also see some beautiful examples of sylmanite. And again, steep foliation, some reaction rims there. Now, in order to talk about this, um, we need to just have a brief review of uh, how rocks flow. And we have um, the lowest temperature flows are granular flow, which doesn't involve any breaking. For example, that would be this upper image here, which shows uh, um, the marbles and clay balls, whoops, um, all of a sudden my screen just went black, marbles and clay balls, and uh, when you deform them, the marbles just rotate um, against one another, and the overall shape of the box is changed, but no internal deformation of the marbles. The clay balls did the same thing, but there was a little bit of internal deformation of the clay balls, right? But no um, faulting, no fracturing. And um, so that's really a ductile deformation as a result of the fact that you are, you've, you've got a, a unit that's mostly unconsolidated. So this is what happens to loose sand. It f deforms by granular flow. If it is, um, consolidated and you apply stresses large, large enough to overcome the frictional, uh, the internal uh, coefficient of friction within the rock, then you get brittle deformation and faulting, which this uh, image right here shows. 
And that's called catac cataclastic flow. And then if you go past the brittle ductal transition, you can get what's called crystal, crystal plastic deformation, which is where you actually recrystallize the rock. It's still in the solid state, but there's no loss of cohesion, no breakage, no brittle structures. And that's what we just saw in the in the metamorphic rocks. And then you can also get melt-assisted flow, which is called viscous deformation. And so all of these exist in the Beaver Dam Mountains. It's very important to recognize them and identify them in order to understand what caused the, the, the event they were associated with. Okay, so these upper parts um, are pressure activated deformation and the lower ones are temperature activated deformation. All right, so first of all, a myelinite. A myelinite is a great example of temperature activated deformation, which is causing grain size reduction. For example, if you look at this image on the left, you can see that um, the quartz here has started to recrystallize into smaller grains. And that's what happens when you have a high stress regime and a high temperature regime at the same same time. Um, you get grain size re reduction by crystal plastic flow, meaning that most of the time here, what's going on is the grain boundaries are migrating. Um, and you can also see that that not all of the minerals in these rocks um, recrystallize at the same temperature. And so, you know, the quartz is usually the first to start to recrystallize and there can be um, garnets or there can be andalusite or whatever within that it's stronger or even feldspar that behaves brittly while the quartz is behaving ductly. We, we actually found some ultramyelinites as well. You can see the field shot to the right where um, the grain size reduction is extreme. We also found some examples of um, sense of shear indicators, meaning that like this photo here, um, photomicrograph here shows biotite grains, which are thrust on top of one another, like an imbricate thrust sequence, which show that the top is moving to the left relative to the bottom, which is moving to the right. And we can use some of the deformational features to get a sense of how much temperature, uh, what what level of uh, thermal metamorphism existed. So we go from, you know, subgrain rotation and recrystallization, which I already talked about on the left, to uh, grain, my, my grain boundary migration, which is on the right. And these happen at different temperatures. We know just from these that were, you know, over 500 degrees C. In terms of measuring the metamorphic structures, we found uh, foliations and lineations um, most of the foliation dips to the southwest at around 60 degrees. And that's what this picture on the right is showing. Okay. When we plot those measurements on a stereograph, uh, you can see that um, the foliation planes actually line up. Oh, sorry, I keep um, moving my cursor to the, to the darkened screen. Um, you can see that they line up along a great circle, which means that they've been folded. And the fold axis is right here. Uh, the mean fold axis is right here in, in these light blues. The light blues are actual measurements that we took in the field of the fold axes. And the blue number three there is the pole to this great circle, which cuts through um, and averages up the foliation measurements. And so uh, when you when you plot the poles to foliation, you're essentially plotting sigma one during the time the foliation formed. And so each one of those would be a, an estimate of sigma one, but then you folded that, which means it's been deformed either progressively from what it was before, and the rock actually rotated in the stress field, or you've changed the stress field. And when we, when we, you look at the structures, you'll 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 be um, able to determine which is which. Okay, so here's here's some foliation that's folded here. You can see um, a restite band uh, in the dark, and it has sylmanite and garnet with reaction rims, 
And then this uh, this is a, a leuco, what we call a leucosome, and these dark ones we call melanosomes. And um, you can see that it's been it's been folded, but it also has a secondary foliation, which is parallel to the axial plane of this fold. Yeah, the axial plane here is more or less horizontal. Call that a recumbent fold, and you can see that the sulmonite um, has grown more or less parallel to that axial plane. This is a closer look of it here. It's worth going to the Beaver Dam Mountains just to see these beautiful rocks. So how do we put that together? Um, this is the, uh, this photo in the middle shows uh, the types of folds that we see. We call them inverted Christmas trees, right? Because they go up like this as you go up to the top of the tree, most Christmas trees go like that, right? So what you see is sheer um, uh, going up this way and going down that way on one limb of a fold, like on this diagram here, you, you can see you have that inverted Christmas tree there. But once you get to the hinge zone, then it goes the other direction. And so usually we use things like fold asymmetry to determine sense of shear. Like in this case, the fold asymmetry here shows that the left is moving this way and the right is moving down. But once you get to the other side of the Christmas tree, it shows the opposite sense of motion. And most of the fold axes you can see here are plunging quite, you know, about 40 to 50 degrees, as you can see in the stereograph. Okay. And so this is kind of a model of what the deformation within the gneiss and the schist looks like. I like to compare it to what's going on in the in uh, glacial de deformation, where you have these beautiful moraines to uh, use as markers. And you can see the same deformation uh, geometry um, where you have uh, trying to get my cursor here. There we go. So you can have, you know, top to the top up here, top down here, top up here, top down here. You have these these um, Zs and Ss on different sides of, of the fold and Ms or Ws within the, within the middle there. And if we uh, look at this example right here, this is what we actually find. We, we, we find a clockwise ro rotation on this limb and a counterclockwise rotation on that limb, which means that this was moving, this fold was, was developing from flow in this direction and this fold was developing from flow in that direction, which is exactly what is ha happening in the glacier. But generally the glacier has one direction of flow, downhill. And so in, unless you can get beyond these nested folds here, which you know um, are at various scales, even in the microscope, you can see this. You can't really tell, if you just get this snapshot here, you can't really tell which way things are flowing. So what I was showing you was um, a, a piece of the, of the Malaspina Glacier right here in this box. But you can see that the glacier is actually flowing down or flowing in this case to the southwest. Okay. And you have those kind of structures on these sides too. Um, and so gen generally we have a flow, flow direction of the metamorphic rocks to the northeast. Now, what kind of tectonic environment were these associated with? Because we essentially have what we call channel flow. Channel flow is what's going on with this ice deformation. It's, it's material that's accumulating here, it's metamorphosing, and then it's flowing down through this channel, right? And that produces these structures. And we have the same kind of thing um, in Asia. I do a lot of my research in this part of Asia here from Java to the Banda Arc. Here's New Guinea, here's Australia. The reason I have it turned upside down with north down is uh, to show you what it probably looked like back in the early Proterozoic, where you had uh, the Cheyenne Belt to the, to the north here, and you had all these island arcs accreting 
to this backstop of Archean rocks. Well, Australia right now has a lot of early Proterozoic rocks, some Archean rocks, and what's accreting to it, already accreted here in New Guinea, are island arcs. You can see all of these island arcs here, which are coming in, and the intervening ocean basins are closing, and they are accreting to the edge of the Australian margin. Currently, the Australian passive margin, which is this right here, you can see this is the passive margin before it actually reaches the the Banda Trench, which is right there. Um, you have a situation where a passive margin in its sediments go down into the subduction zone and create a metamorphic channel. If you look at this image of the Himalaya, you can see that you have opposite uh, flow directions um, on both sides. Okay, here you have clockwise ro rotation on the left and you have counterclockwise rotation on, on the right. And you can see you have this Malaspina glacier type flow of the, him of the Tibetan plat plateau and the metamorphic rocks that are, that are in it over the Indian craton. So we think that the beaver dams and maybe some of the other metamorphic complexes in U Utah that we've seen that are a lot like the, be the beaver dams are part of this suture zone where you have um, metamorphic channel flow. Okay, what about um, the stuff that's on top of the metamorphic rocks? Well, you have that passive margin, a beautiful passive margin has developed. One of the longest lasting passive margins in earth history, you know, at least three to 400 million years. And um, here's the stratigraphy. It's the same that you see in the, uh, in the Grand Canyon, to Peach Sandstone, Bright Angel Shale, Bonanza King, so on, up to the Redwall Limestone. And, and that's what you see here at the top of the sequence. And you see um, the Tapit Sandstone here, you see the shale of the Bright Angel, and, and then you see the Bonanza King, uh, Nopa uh, Dolomite Muddy Peak, and then the Mississippian on the, on the top. But as you start to map this, you come into some very interesting structures. And again, we've got to go through this to talk about what these are. These structures are ductile. They look just like the structures you see in the metamorphic rocks. But these rocks have not been heated high enough to have recrystallization, and so they can't be metamorphic rocks. And they, def they had to have deformed in a way that allowed for ductile deformation to, to occur at low temperatures, which is granular flow. There's no evidence, or very little, that any of these were cataclastically broken. And so you have to come to the conclusion that um, that these, these rocks were, were deformed before they were lithified. And the way you come to that conclusion is you see things like this, where it, here's you know, some limestone coming down and it just gets truncated right against this surface right here. Okay. And below that, these rocks are completely un un unfolded, right? And above that, you have rocks, again, that are unfolded. So you have this intraformational deformation sandwiched in between undeformed rocks. This is, this is a beautiful example of what um, we would call gravity-driven um, intraformational soft sediment de deformation. You can see here this upper unit undeformed. Well, you could say, well, this is an angular unconformity. You know, these units were deformed and this was paused later. Until you see this lower unit right here completely undeformed, right? So this had to have happened after this layer was deposited and before that layer was deposited. And look at these beautiful structures, but also look at how the hinges of these folds, you know, have widened. The, the thickness of bedding varies greatly through here. And that's all ductile flow, which is due to granular flow at low, low, low temperatures, these are just really weak rocks and they deform in a ductile way. 
Okay, so here's another example of the red wall limestone truncated along this glide plane. And the thing that's bizarre is you walk up to that glide plane and you can't even, ex I mean, you, you can see the rocks above and you can see the rocks below. You can put your finger right on the contact and there's no evidence at all of any kind of brecciation or slicken lines or any evidence of brittle deformation at all, even though these are completely unmetamorphosed. Okay, here's some other examples. Here's here's you know a classic type of um, deformation that you see in soft sediment situations, and you see these all over. You see thickening of the hinges, right? Changes in bed thickness, all of the things that you would see in that metamorphic rock. Um, you see isoclinal folds over here in this in this in chert that's embedded in the limestone. So the limestone mud was soft. And the chert was soft enough that it was able to flow like this. And again, you search this rock. You can see some fractures within some of the chert because that was probably semi-solid versus the lime mud. But in most cases, you just see ductal deformation with, with um, a tremendous amount of strain. I wanted to show you an example of a current passive margin which has these kind of structures. This is off the coast of South Africa. And you can see here this lower layer completely undeformed or mostly undeformed, the upper layer the same way. And in between that, look at this imbricate thrust system that developed in the toe of the slide of these beds. And then this essentially basin and range, which is developed in the um, upper part of the slide. And look at the deformation within the units here. These are some other seismic sections that are closer in, you, you can see the same thing, undeformed below, undeformed above, and then you can see these, these thrust faults in the toe, and then in the upper part where, where the slide uh, started from, you can see all this extensional deformation. Okay, so we've had two events, both of them have been ductile, one had been the metamorphism uh, due to channel flow, the other is uh, um, ductal deformation due to slumping, slumping of pre-lithified sediments off of the passive margin. Well, then the cordier neurogeny starts to write on top of this. And what we, what we see in the beaver dams is essentially what we call a paracline, where you have a fold that plunges in both directions. And, and this example from Higgins et al. that I copied and pasted here, shows how paraclines form. They form by differential movement along the thrust. So the thrust initiates, and as it, as it starts to propagate, the thrust pro propagates perpendicular to the direction in which it's moving. And eventually, you know, the thrust is going to go from maximum displacement in the middle to no displacement on its edges. And so the amount of structural relief that the thrust has decreases towards its edges. And so you get a double plunging anticline. Those of you that live in Utah Valley, you look up at the Wasatch Range and you see Squaw Peak, which plunges, you know, which is beds plunging to the north. And then you go over to, to uh, Springville and you see them plunging back to the south. And you have this big uh, Y mountain paracline, okay, for the same reason. So that's what we also have here in the beaver dams. We we have this big dome essentially that's formed in the middle where the metamorphic rocks are. And you can see sedimentary cover sequences, which are folded um, also in that same kind of uh, uh, crestal uh, ge geometry. This is, uh, you know, a snow shovel over here showing that you've got your maximum displacement here in the middle and little displacement on the edges, which forms this kind of bow and arrow shape. So this would be like, you know, um, the pointing the, the direction of flow, of thrusting and, and folding. You, you can see these kind of crescent shaped um, geometries in the entire, in, in, in Utah, in this case, you have a bunch of these, right? And then you see this one in southern Utah involves the Virgin Mountains and the Beaver Dam Mountains. 
So there was deformation due to fold and thrusting. This is our working cross section. So you can see here the steep dip of the foliation and the units within the metamorphic rock. You can see that, that there's an angular unconformity there and also uh, non-conformity where you have the tinic, the bright angel shale, the bonanza king, and so on all the, all the way up. And there they form this forelimb of what we call a fault bend a fold, the fault right here. We don't know exactly what units are underneath this, but we're, we're, we're guessing here that we have Cretaceous um, uh, Cedar Mountain formation and, and uh, uh, Jurassic Temple Cap and, and the Navajo Sandstone underneath this. You can also see there's some normal falls to cut through the whole thing. And on the left here, you see that this, uh, that, that this fault bend fold has also been cut by normal faults. And if you look here on the left, you can see some of the units that appear that they've slumped off, right? Um, and a lot of, of stratigraphic sequence missing as a result. So this is what looks just like Everest right here. Okay, these metamorphic rocks and then these slump features. All right, so let's talk about the exhumation. So we've gone through the accumulation phase. So we've gone through the convergence phase and now we're in the exhumation phase of a mountain building event. And uh, this right here is the, uh, the state geological survey map, which shows the Bonanza King overlain by the Redwall limestone of Mississippian age sitting right on top of the metamorphic rocks. Okay, and uh, we didn't, we didn't di disagree at all with the way that was mapped. Um, and the major difference was that the slide blocks that are to the west of this, which were mapped over here as um, tertiary muddy creek formation with some Mississippian red wall included. And they mapped all of these as slide blocks sitting on top of the muddy creek formation. We didn't find, for example, we did not find slip contacts along each one of those Mississippian um, Redwall limestone blocks. We didn't find any Muddy Creek in those blue, right? These are all um, parts of the lower part of the Redwall, which is which is uh, sedimentary breccia. And <clears throat> um, the initial interpretation was that that these Mississippian Redwall limestone blocks were sitting right on top of the late tertiary Muddy Creek formation. We could not confirm that relationship anywhere that we looked. For example, this is the actual contact that that interpretation is based on. So right on top here is the Mississippian Redwall limestone and underneath is a breccia zone. These are big blocks that have come off that overhang there. And this is what was interpreted as the Muddy Creek formation right here with the Mississippian on top of it. And the contact was interpreted as some kind of a landslide contact. But there's absolutely no evidence when you go there. In fact, there are, there are um, blocks within both the unit down here and the unit here, which actually has um, cobbles and pebbles like going across that surface there. There was a little bit of relief with cobbles and this was deposited right on top, top of them. No evidence of any motion at all. So this right, right, right here doesn't have any metamorphic class. It doesn't have any of the stuff that most of the Muddy Creek has. And it hasn't been dated as, ter ter it's just been inferred as tertiary. But when you look at it, it's all made up of um, older Cambrian units and, and maybe some of the Devonian pieces. This is just, you know, a sedimentary breccia. You can trace this all the way into the Grand Canyon. It's, it's exposed in many places wherever the red wall limestone is exposed throughout this area. So we think this has been misinterpreted. Uh, this is an example of, of uh, a fault that cuts through. You can see here, there, there is a fault that cuts through both units. Um, 
right there. And so you can actually see that along that, that fault, there's a, there's a damage zone, there's some slick and lines and stuff like that, the kind of thing you would expect to see if there's been slip, but the rocks above it and below it and that contact there shows no deformation at all. Okay, so here's that detachment fault. Um, and again, you could say, well, maybe this is still, uh, um, you know, the base of a mega, of a mega land, land, landslide. And so we were debating back and forth and back and forth. We saw some really nice looking lined surfaces with, with manganese deposits and so on on them. And um, hopefully uh, Jim Evans, with his help, we can, we can see if we can get a temperature on those. But those kind of things would not settle the argument. You see all of these relationships that show that there's collapse going on. But is it is it just local gravitational collapse or is it actually tectonic collapse? Th these are the, uh, we found many fault surfaces and with slick and lines on them. Th this one right to the left here uh, shows the fault surface right underneath one of those limestone blocks of the red wall lime limestone. And it's sitting right on top of metamorphic basement. Okay, these are the orientations of all of the faults that we found, plus their slick and line um, orientations. And when we started looking at the metamorphic basement right below that, those slick and lines, we could see that they had experienced a green schist metamorphic overprint. That was the clincher, because a mega landslide would not cause that. There had to have, this had to have happened deeper in the earth. It had to have been associated with a tectonic fault zone, not something that, that you know, started at the surface and broke downward, but something that started downward and broke upward and moved a fault block down. And you can see large zones of gouge and large zones of breccia within the footwall and the hanging wall, which is not common along um, um, make, make a land, land, land size. This is some of the green schist metamorphism on one of our cross sections. This is, uh, I mean, thin sections. This is what it looks like. We have the, this retrograde metamorphism going on here. So they're very high temperature migmatites and paranises of the metamorphic rocks were actually being retrograded to green schist faces. You can see here on the left, some of the chlorite and epidote veins that cut through these, these rocks. Okay, so summary. Um, we have that deformation occurring along a low angle normal fault. And there could still be uh, gravitational instabilities that took advantage of that normal fault and allow for sliding of some of the rocks, but we don't see any evidence, independent evidence that suggests that. We do know that it is a low angle normal fault due to the fracturing, the hydro fracturing along that fault, which is all over the place, the thickness of the damage zones, and also the fact that you break class that have been broken several times. In the actual breccia, you have several generations of slip. And the most important thing is the fact that you've retrograded the metamorphic rocks beneath it. Um, and so when this was interpreted initially, there was some mixing up of some of these structures. For, for example, there have been publications that suggested that the gravity sliding in the passive margin units are also part of this massive mega landslide. But obviously those had to have happened when they, be, before they were lithified. And um, the slide blocks have also been interpreted as being slid on top of tertiary rocks, but we couldn't find the tertiary rocks. They were actually Mississippian breaches. And so um, we've had those essentially five major um, episodes and together it produces a beautiful palm test of the structure 
that we can see associated with the development of the North American Cordillera. Thank you. Any questions? Go ahead, Bob, and ask your question. Yeah, Ron, very, very good talk. It, it's good to see mapping of, of those Precambrian rocks, finally, and and your work on the, the green schist facies overprint, I, I think that's really good evidence for that main structure being a low angle detachment fault like you described. Um, and then I didn't, when I went about compiling that St. George map, um, I actually didn't get to spend much time at all out in the Beaver Dam, so it's mostly compilation. Um, but the idea that the red wall has all these sedimentary brushes, I think, is a really powerful argument, too. So that's really interesting to me. But one comment I guess I had is that there are places where we do see the red wall, that brescia, however it formed, um, sitting on top of bona fide Muddy Creek formation. And the Muddy Creek is full of volcanic class. It's full of Cayenta or Navajo class. And the red ball block is sitting on top of that. So that's something that I guess I'm a little unclear of. If that, if you couldn't be maybe looking at two different things, the detachment fault and then possibly some smaller scale sliding of that upper plate into the Muddy Creek Basin. I think I agree with you 100%. We, we went to a place where um, on the map it was supposed to have existed, but we could see like, like young alluvial conglomerates. We didn't know if they were Muddy Creek or, or, or not. So may, maybe we actually saw some of the outcrops you're talking about, but we think there that that could be an example of some local land landsliding or, or even even large scale landsliding which reactivated that that uh, that was that, that was caused by reactivation of that um, of the, the detachment fault which we call the Beaver Dam low angle normal fault. Um, so it'd be great if you could if you could identify where you think some you know unambiguous examples of that are, I would love to go see those. Yeah, I'll take a look. This was, a, of course, a long time ago that I was out there, but I'll look and see and get you some XY coordinates of a few outcrops that you may have looked at already, but I'll pass those on anyhow. Yeah. But but really- yeah, so how, how, how did you, so um, did, did, you, did you determine it was Muddy Creek by the class or was there some other way that you get, got an age? No, we don't have an age and that would be something good to do. Look at the tridal zircons or something, but it was the, the class composition of just seeing what looked like alluvial fan deposits of yeah. everything except the crystalline rocks. There were no crystalline rocks in it. Um, so, so they were older. They weren't like the modern fans that are full of all these nices and oh, okay. air nices yeah. and everything. So. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. I think yeah. I agree with you. I, yeah. I, 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 I don't think that there's anything that we found that would argue against that. You got a question, Ron. Uh, this is Tom Chidsey. Hi, Tom. How you doing? No, great talk. Really enjoyed it. I've never been to the Beaver Dams. Of all the places in Utah, I have not been there, and I, I need to put that on my geologic bucket list. Just just a, a quick question. Are you familiar with the foal train in the Carmel Formation that's on the west flank of the San Rafael Swell? Um, no, I'm not. I, if you'd like, I can send you the paper. We did a geosite on that and another thing. It's a, yeah, I never knew it was there. All the times I've gone down I-70, across the swell. I've never noticed it was there till I finally saw a little little article about it. It's called the Reeds Wash Area. And it's within one of the members of the Carmel. There's about nearly a hundred um, anticlines that are within this. Again, it's kind of like what you described with a undefined, um, both um, 
uh, undeformed units above and below. And then within this one unit, perhaps gliding along uh, some of the gypsum units or there are some of the, the shaley units there, you have this train of, of nearly 100 anticlines. They're roughly about 50 feet, very, very tight. And I was just wondering, I've speculated uh, that they might be some sort of gravity slide off the, the crest of the swell. However, what you're presenting would suggest that perhaps that they're, they could be soft sediment much more, you know, very shortly after deposition. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love your take on it based on what you presented here today, and I'd be happy to uh, send you the article that I did. Mine was more of a description of that. So um, anyway, just a, a comment. The next next time you take I-70, look north as you're as you're going down the um, towards the west off of I-70 and look north. Uh, you'll see this this thing, and it's it's once you know it's there, it's like holy holy smokes! How did I miss that all these years? But I really like your take on it. Thanks. Well, it's interesting that that uh, Riley uh, Brinkerhoff there has his drone in his hand because I took my my drone down to. Uh, uh, the San Rafael swell, and I have some really good drone images of a lot of that folding, so I might have actually s seen it. Great. Um, and I would completely agree with you that it's probably soft sediment deformation. And a lot of people ask me, well, what was the trigger, right? And a lot of times soft sediment deformation has been um, kind of confused with seismites. Which is which is a really weird term because it's not it's not describing the sediment; it's describing some kind of event, and and there's several different ways in which you can get mass wasting of a stack of sedimentary rocks without any tectonic um, trigger, and uh, you know all, all you got to do is is get a zone of high pressure of high fluid pressure, and it essentially reduces the friction to almost zero. And just sedimentation alone can load a margin and cause that sliding, just like it did in that African example. And that's, there's more examples than just that, that one. There's lots of them all, all over the active passive margins that, that show that they are, that they are collapsing because they're, they're, they're unstable due to sedimentation, not due to, to te tectonics. And I would be interested to know if you have seen other examples on the scale that I showed um, of, you know, truncated bases and all kinds of structures that 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 verge to the west or verge to the south or that it, some people have mapped as Cordilleran deformation, but I don't think it is. The, the crest of these things kind of verge to the west. Um, you do see some of this kind of soft sediment stuff up on the Rock Springs uplift, right along I uh, I-80 up there, too. Yeah. In that area. Anyway, I'll send you the article that I put together. It's like I say, it's more descriptive than trying to. I never try to f interpret anything. That just gets me in trouble. So I'll just send it to you and you can figure it out. <laughs> Come on, Tom. You're braver than that. <laughs> I'm a coward. <laughs> Thank you. Great talk. I got to get down to deeper dams. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Ron before we wrap up here? Well, Ron, this was a phenomenal talk. I really appreciate it. Like you said, not a lot has been done down in the beaver dams in terms of looking at those maps. So being able to see how a lot of this movement occurred, where these rocks came from, super fascinating. Love your passion for geology. It's always fun to hear from you. Um, well, thank you for the invite. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm humbled to be I'm humbled to be among such great geologists. I feel the same every time I get in contact with any of you. Just great opportunity. Thanks everyone too for coming, supporting Ron, supporting UGA. We really, really appreciate it, and look forward again to to future meetings and hopefully future meetings when we can get back together in person. So take care, everyone. Thanks so much. All right. Bye.